9-11 is today. We're going to talk to a young woman who has not been on this program before. She has done an extraordinary amount of research, however, and I assume she's standing by there. Rebecca, are you there? I am, yes, I am. Where are you? Don't have to tell me the town. What what state are you in? What part of the country? I'm in uh, the western part of the United States. Good. Right that narrowed it right down. I like that. <laughs> All right. Rebecca Roth is our guest, and uh, I've subtitled it 9-11 Who Done It. Rebecca has done some extraordinary work, and I want her just to kind of jump into that, and, and we'll follow along and and chime in here and there and ask her to amplify and, and further elucidate on things. But what got you pulled into this? Uh, you know, I uh, stopped flying in about 2004. And you I were really a, a hostess. Yes, I was. I was an international purser and a flight attendant for about 30 years at the time of 9-11. Wow. Um, I flew until about 2004. And then I never really looked back at the airline or 9-11 or anything else. I uh-huh. saw it unfold on television just like everyone else did. Yeah. And um, in 2008, nine somewhere in there, in my retirement, I thought, well, I'll just write that novel everyone I flew with told me I should write. So I started to write a novel just about life in the jet stream and what it was like to do what I did for a living. And I traveled, and I saw lots of great places, met lots of neat people all around the world. Uh-huh. I thought, well, this would be really kind of fun to base a novel on. And then um, about, I don't know, chapter two or three into my novel, I decided I'd, I'd introduce a Middle Eastern character, and I wanted to grab a name. So I Google searched 19 Arab hijackers from 9-11. Mm-hmm. And lo oh, and behold, up in front of me came a BBC article written September 23rd, 2001. How did I miss this? Six of the hijackers were still alive. At least four of them were professional airline pilots out of the Middle East. And I was just absolutely shocked. Cause yeah, I, that, aren't there more still alive? I think, there's uh, actually ten. Ten, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, that, they, yeah, that, I can see how that knocked you over, sure. <laughs> it sure did. And I, I was like, I was so shocked. And then I, I read a little bit about these, uh, you know, hijackers still alive. I started Googling, mm-hmm. and started looking, and then I started discovering other things. I set that novel aside and did thousands of hours of research into 9-11 because I have to honestly tell you, even though I never looked back and I couldn't really go there uh, mentally. Right. I knew from day one that cell phone calls cannot be made from altitude. And when I started hearing that, and I started hearing that the flight attendants themselves were making cell phone calls, uh-huh. reservations and you, different you family, yeah. I knew that was wrong. It's not yeah. protocol. Yeah. It can't happen. And then I, I saw and heard so many things that were wrong that my I just put my brain on uh, don't go there. Look, I'm not going to go there. Because I flew for a few years after that. And listen, when you're flying, your safety net is NORAD and the U.S. military. And I've had jets scrambled for me before for different incidences over my career. Huh. And they come to your wingtips, and it's very frightening because sometimes you can see their arms, armament hanging from them. And uh, they'll maybe shoot you down. You just don't know. But the feeling is horrible, except they do scramble and come to, to your rescue in six minutes. On that day, it took almost two hours. And... After Whoops, nine, something wrong there. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, my first question was, um, well, when somebody called me and said, turn your television on right now, and I'd just gotten home from Europe, and I'd, I'd come in as a purser, so mm-hmm. I hadn't seen any FAA uh, warnings about hijackers or anything, or Al-Qaeda, and we'd never been told about uh, Tim Osman, I mean, uh, Osama bin Laden. Tim or, Osman, yes. <laughs> or I, I later on found out he was a CIA asset in the yeah. mid-80s. To start up the Mujahideen for the CIA. And so I I didn't know about him or um, Osama bin Laden or Al-Qaeda. They had never told us or warned us that this could be possible, a hijacking group. Mm -hmm. And I was was so shocked. I saw that second plane go into the South Tower like a hot knife through butter. And honestly, I thought it was either trick photography or a new rendition of War War of the Worlds. Wow. I thought it was somebody was joking because Mm -hmm. planes cannot disappear into a steel building. They're made of aluminum. And if you've ever seen an aircraft that's been in a real major hailstorm or hit by a large bird, they do a lot of damage. Those those planes are very fragile. I've seen them take a bird strike and a lightning Mm -hmm. strike and Mm -hmm. and 
see what happens. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I really thought it was some kind of trick photography. And I, I really I had jet lag and I didn't know what was going on. And the person on the other end of the phone was saying, it's terrorists. And like, well, you know, later on that day, I said, well, how did they get control of NORAD? <laughs> how did they control our military? That was my main question is, so how could somebody on a, you know, the laptop and a satellite phone right. stop NORAD from scrambling? And how, uh, how many hours? Well, they were an hour and 45 minutes, I believe. My goodness. Close to yeah. New York. Yeah. Yeah. But it's really interesting what happened. Well, then we get the story about, uh, who was it? Leon Panetta? I can't remember now. About Dick Cheney being told. Yeah, and that was Norman Mineta. Norman Mineta, not Leon Panetta. Yeah, see, with six. <clears throat> Kind of yeah. like they could be a part of the same song. Mm -hmm. He was actually in the bunker with uh, Vice President Dick Cheney. Mm -hmm. because a young soldier would come in and say to the vice president, uh, the aircraft is 20 miles out, sir. They give him mileage checks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Was... And um, so he said the airplane is five miles out, sir. Do your orders still stand? And Norman Mineta, you know, he's on record saying this. I b believe he said it at the 9-11 commission hearings, I think think and um or before that i know he's certainly on record just saying that it's very well known and dick cheney said have my my orders still stand my have i changed no no my orders still stand as if he knew what was about to happen and shortly thereafter just a moment uh something hit the pentagon and so what I found in looking for my second book, because I've just released the second book, Methodical Deception, mm -hmm. is I followed up with people like Norman Mineta. And ah, very good. From the FAA. Yeah. And I know I'm going to send you these books as soon as um, I want to send you hardbacks. And I think oh, they'll thank you. come I, in on, on Wednesday for the new book. I and, appreciate uh, that. The first book is uh, Methodical Illusion. Uh -huh. And the second book is? Methodical deception. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. And so what I did was I followed up with people that I think should have lost their jobs that day mm -hmm. and and found where they went and where they're sitting, on, what board of directors they're sitting ah, on. Ah, yeah. Where, they absolutely. got rewarded. They got, uh, oh, yeah. they got, they got yeah. big, the big prize. Yeah. Yeah, really big prize. And, you know, it's interesting it's talking about Norman Mineta. You know, if you listen to the official story of 9-11... Boy, one, a ra are you right? A rapper would love those two guys in a song. <laughs> they would. <laughs> and if you listen to the official story, they claim mm -hmm. there was a gun on board, mm -hmm. there was a, a bombs on some mm -hmm. of the aircraft, mm -hmm. knives and box cutters, and pepper spray and mace. Mm -hmm. Those were all illegal to bring on board an aircraft at mm -hmm. the time of 9-11. And so you have to look at who was running security. And these are the things that I looked at in every single detail on 9/11. Well, and unfortunately, I, uh, we know now who was. So tell us who was on, who was running the security. Yeah, this is very interesting. There was a company started out of Israel called ICTS International, mm -hmm. and they had a subsidiary in the United States called Huntley USA. And I remember seeing ICTS and Huntley USA almost everywhere I went. Hmm. It, that because that was before That's, the really so they they penetrated the entire uh -huh. area aeronautical business industry and got into practically every airport exactly but what's really weird is the company ICTS was started by an Israeli convict who had been convicted of um making fraudulent documents campaign finance uh problems and two or three other things he'd actually was in prison and so he gave the company uh control to somebody else in Israel and they brought that company to the United States as Huntley USA and for some reason United and American both signed up with them they controlled almost all of their security and uh, almost every other airport in the united states did but what's really weird huntley or icts international runs security uh, all over the eu they ran security when richard reed the tennis shoe bomber came through charles de gaulle yeah. they ran security also through amsterdam Schiphol airport when the panty bomber that almost took northwest airlines down going into detroit on a christmas morning Mm -hmm. uh, same they ran that security they ran security at boston logan at Dulles International, Washington, D.C., and Newark on 9-11. So you think, okay, now how did they get bombs and knives and all of that stuff? Yeah. So at three airports, now we know of five actually, where 
supposed terrorists with bombs uh-huh. had allowed through Huntley. Guess who's sitting on their board of directors right now? The no. Secretary of Transportation, no. Norman Mineta. Oh, no. Think about this. In reality, they failed yeah. to stop the shoe bomber, the underwear bomber, yeah. and everything that happened on 9-11. But one thing I did discover is there were not 19 Arabs on the real passenger manifest. That's a story that's generated just by the FBI as mm-hmm. part of the cover-up of what really did take place. Mm-hmm. Wow, Rebecca. Wow. What a <laughs> journey you've been on. What you have seen, uh, you, you know too much. Uh, it's in your books. Uh, I'm very happy about that. I hope that they do very well. Uh, it's time that we get the truth of this out. Uh, the, the the words, the terms, inside job, really don't even come close to the uh, the dynamics involved in this tragedy. It was huge. Mm-hmm. We were sold out by our own. Uh, will you tell us? Well, that's true. And what happened to me was I um, I immediately, once I started to see the hijackers were alive, I, I found an FBI document was a transcript of the two flight attendants from Flight 11. They were the first two people to call and to contact anyone that they were being uh, hijacked or something ah. was wrong. Uh-huh. So it was very fortunate because I just put my flight attendant shoes back on and said, okay, I'm going in there with them. And I listened to every word. And Betty Ong called reservations, which is a line no flight attendant would call because you're on hold just like you guys are, just like passengers, 10, 15 sure. minutes on hold. Mm-hmm. And if you're calling in in a real emergency like a hijacking, you can't be on the phone for a long period of time because if a real hijacker saw you on the phone, they'd probably you're toast. Kill you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that was not part of the protocol, was to make phone calls outside. But we had two flight attendants that did that. One used a cell phone, and one used an onboard phone. And Betty on called reservations, and she said, one hijacker as a he has sprayed pepper spray or mace in business class, and we can't breathe in business class. And I read huh. that again, and I thought, wait a minute. Now, what's what went through my 30 years career in my mind? Uh-huh leaving Honolulu with that cheap perfume, that flowery stuff they would spray in, and, and uh, the whole airplane would fill up with it. Somebody sprayed it, you know, everybody smelled like puka flowers or something. Or dropping a duty-free rum uh, somewhere in the airplane, everyone would smell it. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, if this airplane were pressurized at altitude uh-huh. and some- sprayed something as bad as pepper spray or mace, both mm-hmm. of which are not legal. Okay, go through the whole plane including the hijackers, would be suffering from it. And yet both of those flight attendants were on the phone for 27 minutes. Neither of them ever coughed, choked, gagged, or said, my eyes are killing me, I can't breathe, I, I'm having trouble. They didn't, you see what they said, there was gas only up in one section. And they talked on the phone for nearly a half an hour. And so she said something else. She said, he stood upstairs. And now, to somebody else, that means nothing, but I know there are only stairs on a 747. She right. was on a 767. No and stairs. I knew, since they were not pressurized uh-huh. and she was calling, uh-huh. they were on the ground somewhere in uh-huh. a hangar, and there are stairs in every corner of a hangar. And so what I did was I thought, well, then 20 minutes from Boston, let me find where they could be. And I knew that those aircraft, because they were heavy, we landed where they were full of fuel to go from coast to coast. Even though the loads were light, they're still landing what we call heavy in the industry. They needed at least a 10,000-foot runway, and lo and behold, if I didn't find a reserve Air Force base, uh-huh. with 18 minutes of Boston, oh, and perfect. four yeah. aircraft were taken over remotely using the flight termination system, mm-hmm. which was sold to the airlines, mm-hmm. to Boeing first from a company called SPC Corporation. Another Israeli company. Interestingly enough, not only that, the CEO of that company was Rabbi Dov Zakheim, who was also the comptroller of the Pentagon. Dov who- Zakheim, who on September the 10th <laughs> announced that there was, what was it, uh, $2 trillion missing mm-hmm. from the Pentagon budget? Yep, he was the banker. He was the comptroller there. He was also the CEO of SPC Corporation. Unbelievable. They- they also have a subsidiary company at SBC called Tri Data. And after the 1993 bombing that uh-huh. the 
I did of yes. the World Trade Center. Tridata got most of the reconstruction and got the blueprints for the towers. 